Good afternoon. I'm Master Sommelier Emmanuel Kamiji, and on this episode of Across the Table with Movers and Shakers, with me is David Bancroft, one of the most talented young chefs, not just in Alabama, where he owns the fabulous uh, restaurant Acre in Auburn, but in all the country, as evidenced by the number of nominations that he's gotten in what is really the Oscars of the culinary world, the James Beard Awards for best chef in, in the South. Um, How do you? <laughs> uh, David, question. you did not go to culinary school. You don't have the typical, you know, uh, for lack of a better word, properly trained background of a, of a typical chef. So a little bit of a cowboy. Exactly. So how, how did you learn to cook? You know, for me, it was a complete hands-on experience. I went to school for finance and accounting, and I was supposed to follow my father's footsteps, and which obviously is very useful for, for restaurant culture. Or owning a restaurant, right? And owning a restaurant, and especially buying the land and owning the real estate and controlling the assets and, um, proved very valuable. But my mother was a science teacher, and not just science, but life science, where you're building things chemically, making volcanoes and explosions. And, uh, Chefs, we do the same. We try not to explode things, but uh, so for me, just the balance of that and the way that, you know, I loved food and eating at Mama Jean's farm table on the farm in Alabama and experiencing all the new flavors when I got to San Antonio, uh, we travel across into Mexico and then get it, I mean, totally mind-blowing combinations, making moles and things that were so in-depth. For some reason, I, my palate, I could just extract it and break it down like an engineer reverse breaking down something to figure right. out how it how it operates and um I, you know i started with the mother sauces read every french book i could get my hands on and trained myself and, and literally trained myself while cooking the food and while serving guests and getting real feedback i mean the hard knocks culinary program um would is there a chef out there that when you were you know earlier on that you'd say this is the guy that kind of influenced me the most is, or, or the lady that you'd say that more than anybody else is there one well every chef would love to say one mine is more like three four <laughs> I mean, definitely Frank Stitt here in Alabama okay, and Birmingham sure. and, and a okay. godfather of Southern cuisine to me, Thomas Keller. And I was just seeing so many similarities between uh, Chef Stitt and Chef Keller. And my parents eventually flew me out to Napa and into Yachtville and walk around in, in his terrain and see his farm. And I got yelled at for you know, stealing soybeans out of his plot and fava <laughs> beans and the farmer came screaming shaking a stick and I just I wanted to taste right out of the field before we even went in and had supper um if Alice Waters there's just so many that were right now I know you have a garden here you talked about the garden at uh, the French Laundry Thomas Keller's uh, place um I had dinner here last night and you brought out a three-year-old ham that you had mm. cured yourself which was absolutely amazing by the way um, so you do, well, it seems like everybody uses or rather abuses the term farm to table. Mm -hmm. What does farm to table mean to you? You know, I, I completely understand how it is used and abused. And so I, I, don't, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole with right. that because it always is accusational, but in reality to me, I had a prime example. I had my grandpa Kennedy. I mean, right above us, there's the chandelier here. This was his fish basket. And we're sitting underneath the fish basket, turned okay. into a chandelier <laughs> from his farm. And all of the wood on the, on the walls here, when we didn't have any stories in a brand new building, grandpa and I went and hand selected oaks from the farm, cut them down, dried, got them cut and brought here to wrap story in the building to make sure that I literally could feel the pulse of this building and feel the heartbeat so that I believed it. Right. And then the experience after, you know, going to Yachtville and to the laundry 
and seeing the farm across the street. When I bought the acre of land, I named the restaurant when I bought the land. I said, how, how big is this? It's an acre. I said, okay. <laughs> That's the, All right. And I walked crazy. off. And, but then I look at Grandpa Kennedy and, and I, the way I explained that their community was the definition of co-op. They existed together. I could still tell you what was in every old butter container and country crop container recycled going down Mama Jean's table when she reused all the old plastic containers. But you had the Pollard's Mill in here and the Doherty's in here and every farm represented and they traded food. That's, and that's, it, was, it was a community that comes together for one purpose and, um, and to exist together. But they did that to create variety in diet. So I already had the example. The bar was way up here right. before I even got going. And that term, that term wasn't really the term when I you kick lived started. The, you lived the term. And you so right. Frank Stitt was doing that at Highlands and Chris Hastings at Hot and Hot. And I looked at their menus and said, why did they have so many first names? What, what is that? And so I came here and I said, I need some first names on the menu. <laughs> what are we doing here? So I, I came and I, to Auburn and I opened up a yellow page and I had read an article about this family starting a CSA program. But I opened the yellow page and I found Frank Randall, Randall Farms, and, and I called Mr. Frank the Shepherd and said, Chef, what do you got? How, how does this work? And still there's no term for this program of Farm to Table. Um, I'm just committing, I'm gonna make this happen. And he said, Well, I have lambs and blueberries. And I said, That's Pardon? what I want. <laughs> I would like lambs and blueberries. Uh, and I got out there and um, I said, Okay, I'd, I'd like a lamb. And he said, I've got it hogtied here. Go ahead. Like, what, what do you mean? He said, how sharp is your knife? <laughs> so I, I didn't just get the experience. I got the biblical experience. Right. And, and when you say you want to value the life of an animal and really tap into what farm the table is, um, having to take the life of a lamb is a whole nother level. Right. And at that point, I walked away from that farm knowing my food was never going to be the same ever again. Now, I know you're a barbecue fanatic. You have another restaurant in Auburn called Bow and Arrow. Um, favorite barbecue style? I mean, it's hard when you're growing up in Texas not to, to call that barbecue. But now I have so many friends, you know, being in the chef industry, um, I've had opportunities to cook with the best of the best from the Rodney Scott's to the Jim and Nick Skies to Chris Lilly's to Sam Jones's. I mean, uh, but I've met some amazing female pit masters and, and had an opportunity to cook with them. And um, honestly, I enjoy any barbecue over the fire. Whatever barbecue and tradition or heritage or family is right in front of me at the time. As long as we all believe it, I'm happy. That's the one. Well, I'm going to bring you around uh, in front of us. Our, uh, is a new project of mine. Um, Are we which, speed drinking? <laughs> no, no. Okay. <laughs> no, which um, uh, I do with the guys that you know down uh, down the street in Opelika at Red Clay with uh, Kerry McGinnis and John Corbin. Um, what do you think about beer as far as pairings with your food in in a high-end restaurant like Acre. Um, your take, does it work or is it a stretch for you and, and what do you think of these? Uh, first off, I think it's amazing that you're working with Carrie and the guys at Red Clay. I mean, that's right down the street. This is our neighborhood and it's not just local, this is hyper-local. Um, and obviously a, a master sommelier making beers. <laughs> so I was extremely excited. And, you know, we have a large program here. We have a large wine program, bourbon program, and definitely craft beer program. As a matter of fact, on our draft systems, we only do craft beers. Okay. Um, we, don't, we don't do any, any game day sports beers. So it's something that we've committed to. And we oftentimes find pleasure in, in treating people and, and educating them to expand a little bit. 
Uh, some of the higher ABVs aren't always for everybody. Some people <laughs> love it. There are, are there obviously now cult followings when, when new beers launch. And right. These, to me, were, were so much to talk about and so much to pair with and gave me so many opportunities just because of your palate and the way that, that, that your mind works, which I don't understand and never will. <laughs> and I wasn't claiming that I know. I don't know. But I do know that... You know, as, as a chef, I could get in and I could, I could hand pick so many of the notes in here that I could have a field day with. So some beers are just drinkable and then some beers just go to the next caliber and, and deserve to be paired with things. And these were all fantastic representations of that. Well, thank you so much. And uh, thank you, as always, for your support of Mura and Los Pisada and all my wines here. Um, I'm honored that they're here at this incredible restaurant. So thank you very much. Pleasure.